Hi, my name is Dustin Messer. I'm a pastor at All Saints Dallas. Once a week or so, we talk with an outside guest to help us think more clearly about God, his word, and his world. Today, we are joined by the editor-in-chief of the Gospel Coalition, Colin Hansen. Colin, how are you doing today? I am doing well. I really appreciate you, Dustin, and I'm glad to be here. Well, uh, I want to ask you some questions about um, revival generally and, and talk a bit about revival specifically happening at Asbury University. But before I do that, I wonder if you'd just recount for us uh, how you came to faith in Jesus. I came to faith in Jesus through a revival movement uh, mm-hmm. with teenagers, and I was 15 years old in rural South Dakota, and I saw something I'd never seen before. I saw people my age who loved Jesus. And that was just powerfully transformative to hear about how Jesus had changed their lives. And I wanted him to change my life, too. So it's been a number of years now and um, just grateful that that's continued. I guess that's been a good like 26 years uh, we're going on coming up this spring. So, um, yeah, just really grateful for that uh, work of Jesus in my life. And it was very unexpected. We have a, a background in, in journalism, obviously. You're maybe mm-hmm. the most astute observer of the church today, so I feel confident that I can ask you, if you would just <laughs> recount for us and characterize what is happening at Asbury. I feel like every day people are asking, uh, just parishioners here at All Saints are asking questions about it. Uh, a chapel service started on Wednesday and then never ended. How would you uh, yeah. kind of characterize what happened after that? Well, I don't have any firsthand account of what's going on there, but what I can say from what I'm picking up on, and we're in a different era now because of social media, and I don't think, Dustin, I've seen another revival of this sort in the social media era. Um, We've had a lot of examples of kind of a new apostolic reformation type work, some more high-profile, demonstrative, charismatic, Pentecostal type, um, type revivals. But what's interesting about the Asbury revival from everything that I'm I'm seeing is it's very similar to, um, well, one, what we've actually seen at Asbury itself and a number of other schools, notably Wheaton College, a number of times over the years, there it seems to follow a pretty similar pattern, similar pattern of a kind of chapel service that seems to be particularly anointed by God with especially powerful singing, prayer. There usually seems to be an, an aspect of confession and repentance. Uh, sometimes with college students, that becomes pretty problematic because all of a sudden they're confessing about lust toward the student next to them. And it gets really awkward really quick. But from what I can see at Asbury, that kind of the main dynamic has simply been a desire to not stop worshiping together uh, corporately um, and uh, testimonies of of conversion or a new sense of God's outpouring of his spirit in, in their lives, uh, minimal but but substantial Bible teaching. One of the things that stood out to me is that they began to cancel class. That made me go back to the Second Great Awakening and Timothy Dwight at Yale University, Dwight um, grandson of Jonathan Edwards, and and uh, remember thinking about how um, he was he did not allow the students to cancel class because Hmm. his thought was the mind and the heart and the spirit they're all one, and so um, that was but. Yale had a number of those revivals that would break out. So in Mm. many ways, what I'm seeing at Asbury is a pretty typical pattern that goes all the way back to the Second Great Awakening, um, and that, especially in New England, and that has continued. Well, then, I mean, well, of course, we could also add the frontier. Kentucky was itself one of the major sites of revival on the frontier of the Second Great Awakening. So you kind of combine the, the Methodist history, Kentucky, the college environment, and what we're seeing in terms of continued uh, corporate worship, confession, testimony, Bible teaching, very demonstrative type physical behavior. The only thing that's a little bit different now is that a lot of people who are interested in revival around the country can hop on a plane, yeah. hop in a car, and they can show up and join it. And so it can be a little bit misleading to people because they might think, wow, these students just won't stop. Well, it's not necessarily the students. It, it's, it's all sorts of people who are flooding onto the campus from all over the country and even the world now. We're kind of keeping that, that going along with the students. But I will say this, I give the students and administration a ton of credit for keeping it within, keeping it in-house. Hmm. The teachers, the worship leading and things like that, keeping that stuff in-house, that's a very wise approach to keep it from being hijacked from somebody on the outside. Yeah. 
we wrote a book uh, called The God's Had Vision, which tells uh, the story of uh, revivals in this country and, and other countries. Uh, but this is the, the release week for a book you wrote on Tim Keller. And I feel like mm-hmm. your publisher would, would probably not be happy if on the release <laughs> week you're you're selling and talking a, a book from seven years ago. So oh, by the way, go, it was yeah. also from the same publisher. So don't worry okay. about that. It's so the they're, same. They're fine. Though. <laughs> they're well, fine. Never if, the, never a bunch of people I'll, buy a God sized vision. <laughs> yeah, we buy both. Uh, I finished uh, the Tim Keller biography on 1.3 speed on Audible that read okay. by you. Okay. So I've heard your, your voice a lot over the past several <laughs> but days. But much faster. But much faster. Exactly <laughs> right. But I want to ground this question in the, the Tim Keller biography, yeah. which starts with a campus revival at Bucknell. It does. It What's does. the nature of revival and why does it seem to be so often in this country and uh in in great britain tied to campuses i think the the answer there dustin is fairly mundane it's that uh older people like me we um all of a sudden we start counting the cost we're like oh man i don't want to stay up all night and pray (laughs) or or it's like i got I got kids I got to feed or I got to take to practice or something like that. Some of that's very understandable. Uh, Some of it's probably just the way the cares of the world begin to choke out the work work of the spirit in our lives. But essentially, you have on campuses a very relationally, spiritually, even physically, just in proximity, intimate environment. And you've got more freedom and you've got open possibilities. You also have uncommon zeal and you sometimes also have a little bit of ambition for attention or a striving for an experience to be able to say i was there during the famous 2023 revival something like that so like most things in the spiritual life it it seems to be a pretty widespread combination of a lot of different factors of why it happens on a campus and doesn't seem to happen in your local church sunday to sunday and yet it the history of revivals you know spreads from the college Absolutely. campus to mm-hmm. churches i often think maybe one of the uh benefits of, of it starting on a college campus is um you know you mentioned uh the marker of confession of sin um uh, right. humility and contrition is so important as god is moving it's one of the first uh mm-hmm. markers of a revival, and there's something about the church. I think being a, a, a bit humbled by uh, God moving in unique ways among young people, and almost right. contrition and humility has to be our first response because yeah. this didn't originate with our planning or programming. It originated on a college campus. So you did, yeah. As I, yeah as I said, you wrote a book on uh, on revivals. I had a friend just today, a very very thoughtful. Uh, uh, Bryn, uh, say, you know, revivals are really a unique modern phenomena. What would you, what would you say to that? Cause I kind of get what he means, uh, when he says that, but how would you respond? Well, I would respond with, um, Martin Lloyd Jones's perspective in part on this, where as he works through the history, you could identify any number of periods of Israel's history yeah. and Judah's history as revival. I think about Hezekiah, I think about Josiah in there. Um, I think about the New Testament itself is basically a church revived, which also is helpful to illustrate that that doesn't mean all the problems of the church go away in revival. But um, you know, Pentecost is at once a, com- it's a unique event in church history, but it's also something of a bit of, I mean, Lloyd-Jones would certainly say that it's the paradigm of revival. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I would say mm-hmm. That you see in the church, a you see in the early church, a you know a called out revived church that's very much keenly in the sense of the of the spirit. I think you can go through and and find any number for the next thousand plus years renewal movements that bear a lot of the revival characteristics within the church. Now again, Lloyd Jones would identify some of them that I would not agree with, the Montanists and the Donatists in part. Um, but essentially there's always a, a kind of a remnant that says there must be more. There's more here. There's more outpouring of the spirit. But you can head all the way into the the pre-Reformation period. You can look at the Hussites, you can look at the Lollards, 
You can call those renewal movements. You can call those reformation movements, but they certainly seem to bear many of the marks of revival. I think the reformation is the ultimate example of a revival um, that we have in church history. Um, Now we call it reformation, but it was nothing if not a widespread dramatic spiritual awakening. Um, That's absolutely what happened. And then once you get to that point, then you have any number of renewal movements that continue within state churches. I think about um, a lot of those dynamics in places like Scandinavia, a lot of revivals breaking out in places like Sweden and Norway, usually as a as a sense of this state church kind of stayed morality is just there's got to be something more for us there Then you could look at the Moravians. Uh, in Germany, same dynamic there. There's always more pushing for more. And the Moravians are the ones who inspire the Wesleys. That's the Asbury tradition, of course, that we're talking about here. So, yes, there does appear to be some dynamic in which seeking dramatic instantaneous conversions as normative is something we can trace back to the modern period. But I don't think, I think we see much more evidence throughout the scriptures and throughout church history of moments in which the church, even though the ordinary means of grace continue, they seem to be endowed with heightened spiritual powers. And, um, and I'm grateful for them. Like I said, they're, not, they're all, you know, they're always different, but um, I'm certainly grateful for the Reformation. That was not a modern movement in that sense. Yeah. So a couple of markers that stood out to me as you were talking, one thing that needs uh, to be in place in order for a revival to have happened is some sort of vivification to begin with. There has right. to be life in order for there to be new life. Or new life. Kind of, exactly. It's not yeah. conver- conversions may flow from it, mm-hmm. but revival is taking those people inside the church and bringing them to a heightened sense of the spirit's presence. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So vivification, uh, a revivification, mm-hmm. a renewal. Um, a second, we've mentioned contrition. You said something mm-hmm. about uh, maybe a unique spiritual uh, power or verve that's present. I wonder if you'd say more about that. What other kind of markers are present in, in a revival in addition to the contrition of the heart? Well, certainly Edwards in his treatise on the religious affections would downplay um, dramatic spiritual manifestations, even though he was himself a keen student of them and even though he welcomed them. But as the First Great Awakening continued, he became increasingly skeptical in some ways of some people who seem to have kind of an, uh, you know, the spirit like we see with Simon, uh, with, with Simon the Magician in Acts of like, I want the power, but not the Savior. Um, I want to roar like the lion, but I don't want the life of the, of the lamb essentially mm. in there. So that that's Edwards will clearly point that out. So Edwards would, would say that a mark of the, of the spirit would be moral transformation as well, um, personally and communally. And the example that's so famous that some people may be familiar with is from the uh, 1907 Welsh revival. And what I, you know, the, it breaks out, especially among the working classes, the coal miners of Wales. And the the saying goes that they would use all of these beasts of burden, donkeys especially, to work in the coal mines. But all of a sudden, they couldn't get any of the animals to move hmm. because the animals didn't recognize any of the language that the miners were using because they weren't swearing <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Um, so, But the point there, it's kind of a silly point, but the broader point is that there has to be some sort of moral transformation edwards would say that anybody can claim some sort of dramatic physical manifestation but only when there is a disinterested love of god that pours forth in loving the people who can't love you back only then is that a kind of particular christian love that is born out in revival so Mm. that those i mean i edwards with his distinguishing marks and his religious Mm -hmm. affections is absolutely vital reading when you're considering these kinds of awakenings yeah uh two, two more questions um as uh, you're in birmingham i'm in dallas we're looking you mentioned some people are getting on planes and going to asbury on mm-hmm. the one hand you know i can be as, as cynical as anybody else and i think is is that really the best thing to do on the other hand a longing to meet God is mm-hmm. so uh, praiseworthy. And to bring that experience home, to share yeah. with others. And and to bring it home. And that's exactly where I was, what I was thinking is, 
you and I want this uh, <laughs> revival to take place in our respective yeah. cities, uh, short of of buying a plane ticket to Kentucky, which I, I went to college in Kentucky and, and yeah. love it as much as the next person, but short of getting on a plane and going there, how can uh, just we as believers in, in our places seek uh, the very same move of, of God in, in our locations? I, I think it comes down to the ordinary means of grace. At one sense, the revivals don't usually, um, I'm just, I'm not a Finneyite, so I don't believe in the new measures of programmatic revival. I believe that we engage in the whole, in the ordinary means of grace, which means we're taking the sacraments, which means that we're preaching the word, which means that we're praying together, nothing terribly fancy there, but that we pray with a certain kind of expectation. The passage that animated my book, God Size Vision, was, was from James when it says we, we have not because we ask not. And so at some level, we don't have revival because we uh, maybe we don't even want it because it would upend our lives so much, but also because um, maybe we're a little scared um, of what it would change. And maybe we just don't even know that we should be praying for that. So just starting with that longing. But I would say uh, I go back to something Archibald Alexander, uh, Second Great Awakening era. Princeton Theological Seminary said about a catechesis and, and revival. And that's that when we're the ordinary means of grace are like building a fire and you lay those logs, you, you put them all there, and then you pray for the Holy Spirit to turn them into a raging fire by sending the flame. And I like that so much because without the spirit, they're just logs. Um, but without the logs, you don't have the fire. And so they have to go hand in hand in there. So I've always thought that's the most helpful way to think about it. So if you want to go to, if you want revival to come, just go to church. Yeah. Pray. Yeah. Um, sit patiently under the teaching of God's word. Sing enthusiastically. Um, you know, follow through on those habits. Work through the liturgy. Um, that's a that's how it happens. And pray expectantly and hopefully that God would bless that. Or even better. Pray that God would send that experience to the church down the street that you don't agree with on everything. Mm. That's a good sign that you want the spirit more than you want yourself to have the experience. Yeah, very well said. Uh, last question. You've been very generous with your time. You conclude that chapter about the revival that took place at Bucknell that Tim Keller experienced, saying that later in Keller's life, uh, people would comment that his preaching was shaped by, and maybe she is, I forget if she was a well-known uh, person or not, but Barbara Boyd, who was a, an inner varsity yeah. campus worker, that mm -hmm. this person who, at least someone like me who loves inner varsity and, and thought I, yeah. I knew some things about evangelical history, I didn't know who she was. Most people don't, yeah. but a, a lot of people know who Tim Keller is. He was marked by this renewal movement yeah. that took place and the future of the church was was changed in the ways in which Keller has changed uh, our church. I wonder I, if you just dream a little bit, um, a secular society like ours, I don't know that you can point to a secular culture that's experienced a revival. Probably depends on how you define secularism. But right. what would be your, your prayer for a the future of a leader at Asbury or in Dallas or in mm. Birmingham marked by a revival, what kind of witness uh, might uh, a, a renewed and revived church have uh, in, yeah. in this secular moment? My guess, and I actually just spoke about this this morning to a group in Birmingham. We were talking about my, my book about Tim Keller and I was just sharing a bit about my calling here in Birmingham and thinking about our own particular burden of history with the civil rights movement and segregation. And I said that I'll know when revival comes to Birmingham, when people are spending time with one another, loving one another, caring for one another, serving one another across the divides that typically um, don't allow that. So whether that be class or whether that be geography, whether that be race, when I see Christians coming together and breaking down those barriers um, through, I mean, through generosity, through charity, through love, through forgiveness, through repentance, through uh, welcome, through hospitality, that's when I'll, I'll be sure that we're experiencing revival in part, Dustin, because 
revival in the end is a longing for is for is for heaven it's for jesus mm-hmm. himself it's for the new heavens and the new earth and and so our picture of revival ought to be a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth and i know that in the new heavens and the new earth we're we're going to be recognizably ourselves but those barriers between us are going to be broken down every tribe tongue nation and people together singing the praises of the lamb who was slain glory glory hallelujah so that's i think if if we want to be sure that we're experiencing something different that would appeal to a secular age we're going to love and serve and even submit to one another in ways that don't make sense for the world um i think that's the compelling witness in a secular age and um you know some revivals do that a lot of revivals haven't um in the past doesn't mean those aren't genuine revivals but that just feels to me dustin like what i would hope for or expect in this era and what i hope spills out from asbury Mm. amen well the first the the best opening sentence of of any autobiography i've read is from a methodist himself i believe Mm -hmm. stanley hauerwas that says i've sought to live a life uninterpretable if jesus didn't rise from the dead Uh, and it is a good one and i I hope that's my prayer is uh, just to echo yours that uh, the church would be so marked and unusual and uninterpretable uh had the spirit of god not fallen upon us well if you're watching this and you go to all saints we have a copy of colin's book of god's has vision on our uh, book table and be happy to give you a copy of that colin thank you again for taking time to talk with us today thank you dustin it's been a pleasure go in peace